Hello everyone, Ron Callis here with One Firefly. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Automation Unplugged. Uh, very excited uh, today to have a, a guest, Tim Albright of AV Nation. He's the founder and the president of AV Nation. And uh, we're going to have a fun 30 minutes of uh, chat and question and answer uh, with Tim. So again, thank you for joining. If you're out there, uh, please share this so that your friends in the industry can join us as well. And uh, let's go over and, oh, there I am. Let's go over and, uh, and talk with Tim. Tim, how's it going, sir? Good. How are you, sir? I am good. Well, as I always do right when I start a show, let me just check the live feed and see if technology is actually cooperating. Uh, so bear with me. I'm checking our One Firefly Facebook page. There we go. We already got uh, six people following us. Thank you, gang. And, uh, you know, if you're out there watching, uh, please, uh, you know, post questions, comments. Um, uh, as we go, if you have a question for, for Tim, our guest, and, uh, and or if you have one for myself, and uh, again, if you don't mind, thanks for, for joining, but uh, please share this. Share this so that other people in the industry can see uh, our live uh, show here. So, Tim, how's your Wednesday going? Uh, Wednesday is, is fine. <laughs> it's, it's the Thursday or Friday or Saturday before Infocom that gets kind of crazy, but today's is not too shabby. I was going to say, so. you have a bit of a wild ride coming around the corner here, don't you? Yes, sir. So, uh, so next week is is our annual trek uh, to either Vegas and or Orlando. This year, it happens to be in Orlando, Florida, uh, for Infocom, uh, the, the their their trade show. Three days in. Um, well, the show is is three days in Orlando, Florida. This year, um, we will land like a lot of folks uh, this weekend. Start preparing uh, our production suite and, and and our various things, and go uh, go see what the the manufacturers have on the show floor. Oh, what what has you excited about Infocom? Oh, um, see, it, Infocom is has become in the industry itself is is a Infocom is a is a small glimpse into the industry, right? And so the industry has been moving more and more towards video over IP, so video on the network, um, not necessarily using Cat five as a transport. Um, in other words, point to point, you know, um, like we have been but an actual honest to goodness networked um audio and video that's what i'm excited to see is what the next generation of that's going to be um both from the transmitter and receiver end and also what what some folks from the the display uh, manufacturing and are, are incorporating that into their devices but also what the network folks are doing right uh last year cisco announced that they were releasing a switch that that supported avb uh, tsn the the ieee standard um, that that's been promoted by the Avenue Alliance. That was a huge step, right? So a switch manufacturer is saying, here's a switch built just for this protocol, built just for this transport. And so whether it's it's AVB or it's Dante or it's HD Base T or it's SDVOE, all of these folks, and I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting some folks, um, but all of these devices and all these manufacturers that are expanding our ability to send video uh, HD video and beyond uh, long distance over the network is, is really, really exciting. Uh, and then there's some other folks that are they're doing some rebranding. They're doing some, some unique things uh, with uh, display manufacturing and screen manufacturing that, that are making some advances. Uh, and then just seeing what, what we don't know. Uh, the one nice thing about trade shows in general, but, but Infocom is really where I kind of honed this, was looking for the small booths in the back corners. There, there you're going to find some of the most innovative and interesting products and services that you may never have thought that you needed or even thought was out there. But those small booths are going are gonna to get some, some really, really great, uh, great nuggets out of. Now, now, does your schedule actually permit you to go and do that navigation and exploration? I, I know personally when I go to a show, I'm usually so tied up with obligations that on occasion I'll, I, I just simply won't be able to go do that exploration. It does now. Um, this is, AV Nation is almost six years old next, next month. And when we first started doing this, I was like, yo, I was like, I got to go see everything. We've got to interview everybody and this, that, and the other. And at this point, uh, 
Now we've they come this, to you. Well, not, no, not just that, but it's <laughs> it's okay. We've got some great folks that help us, right? And they do the interviews and this, that, and the other. And um, we have strategically placed blanks in, in all in all of our schedules okay. for that discovery. Right. Uh, our team has the directive of, you know what, if you find something that's, oh, my gosh, you've got to interview this folk, these folks, because you've got to get this out to, to people who aren't here in, in Orlando. They have the flexibility and they have the margin now to do that. Do you, do you mind giving my audience here and we have 10 people watching live? Hey, everyone, again, don't forget to share this and uh, also post your questions so we can ask Tim live. Um, but Tim. Uh, some of my audience may not know what AV Nation is. Mm -hmm. and so you mentioned that you founded AV Nation uh, six years ago. Can you give just a little bit of a background on, on what that platform is? We are a online media platform, uh, meaning that we don't physically create a, a physical product. Uh, we don't have a magazine. Uh, we're not on traditional terrestrial radio or television. So that means our delivery mechanism is over the Internet, whether that's we, we produce several podcasts so you can subscribe to an RSS feed and, and be automatically uh, given the shows that we produce. We also have a YouTube channel because most of our shows that we produce are both audio and video. So you can, you can watch our guests uh, in addition to, to just listening. And the blogs that we produce and the pieces that we write is, is all on our website, avnation.tv. So we're an online media platform, online media company that, that services and covers the audio video industry. Uh, primarily when we started was, was commercial. Uh, over the last two years, we've expanded now into residential as well. Okay. Now, one thing I always like to ask my guests, because I, I think it's fascinating to learn where people came from. How did you end up, how did you land in the AV industry and, and how long have you been in this space and did you have a career or a life before the AV space? I've, I've answered this a couple different ways and I consider myself to be a 25, 30 year veteran of, of AV. Um, mainly because I consider live staging and events part of AV. Um, so I started when I was a teenager uh, doing audio and video for my church and for theater and this, that, and the other. Uh, ended up in broadcast uh, television and radio. Uh, spent a number of years there. And you, you landed, do have a voice for radio. Well, thank you. I also have a face for radio. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> I'm not um, saying nothing. Okay. But that's an old joke, kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, landed as a tech manager. At, uh, at the college I went to, and um, the the tech manager position was as they as they put it to me, oh yeah, by the way, you have to you have to switch out a handful of projectors every every summer. I'm like, oh, I could do that. And what happened was, in the state of Illinois uh, is not is not known for having uh, great budgets nor a whole lot of money. Uh, so uh, when it all was said and done, I ended up being the programmer, the designer, and the and the lead installer for about 180 rooms uh, uh, for our, our multiple campuses. And that exposed me to a lot of things, it exposed me to Infocom, exposed me to Cedia, exposed me to, to several control manufacturers, switcher manufacturers, and I absolutely fell in love with the industry. Um, probably about four or five years into this, I had gotten hooked on, on podcasts, and, and one in particular was a, by the guy by the name of Leo Laporte, who still does uh, This Week in Tech. And... Leo is an old radio guy, and I'm like, I can, I think I can do this. So I looked around to see if if there was anybody that did what I was looking for, which was a a weekly digest of of the news that you know other uh, physical magazines were producing, and there wasn't. And I'm like, okay, so I'll, let's I'll, I'll ask around, and and I had connect with some folks on social media, and I just kind of raised my hand and said, you know, I'd like to do this. Does anybody want to to join me? Anybody want to jump on a, on a call? And flabbergasted and, and humbled by the response that I got. Um, connected with a, a couple of folks that I didn't meet in person for a well over a year. Um, but we started our first one at the end of July in 2011. And two weeks ago, we did episode 300. So we haven't, you know, we've done a weekly, that weekly show every, every week for about six years. I think you. Uh, I've, I've been honored to be a guest on some of your yep. shows over the years, and uh, I think uh, if my memory may may or may not be accurate, but I'm trying to dust the cobwebs off. I, I think you had me on maybe back in 2012. Mm -hmm. I know I was in my old office, and uh, I, I thought that was the biggest thing that happened to me in quite a while when you invited me to be on that show. <laughs> well, so I, I was 
uh, quite flattered, and I'm flattered that you've joined me on on this show. It's not a not, not a podcast, but we're streaming live to Facebook to the Facebook Nation. Yep. What was your vision, Tim, when you created AV Nation? What was your goal? What impact did you want to have on the people that would listen to your content? My main goal is the same one I have now. Um, I want to give the integrators and the tech managers and, and the folks that that live and breathe in this industry the information and the news that they need on Monday morning going into the office um, and why it matters to them. All of the magazines in, in, the, in the AV industry do a really, really great job of covering the industry, getting interviews, uh, and, and giving us the information. But the one thing that they lack a lot of times is, is the why. You know, why does it matter that, that Harman was bought by Samsung? You know, why does it matter that this company has developed this new transport? Why, why does that matter? And what we hope to do by having on audio video professionals, whether it's a manufacturer, it's a consultant, it's a program, whoever, right? The, the one thing that, that is our strength is the fact that everybody at AV Nation still works in the industry, right? Uh, we, have, we have consultants and we have engineers and we have marketing professionals. And all these people kind of add to that mix. Um, if you look at, at who's on, you know, on our air and, and who's on our shows, it's the same people that you're going to find an integrator in Boise, Idaho, or the same folks you're going to find at an integrator in New York. Uh, and that's kind of what we hope to bring is, is the context to the news and the information that, that's out there on a weekly basis. So, Tim, I'm curious, those that are watching, if how many of them have listened to one of your, your many shows, what would be the names of some of those shows? I know there's Resi uh Week. There's Resi Week, which you were you were just on a few weeks ago, uh, which is our residential weekly show. Uh, AV Week is our flagship. Uh, I call it our flagship because it's the longest running one we have. And so what it's you're the, saying is I haven't been on the flagship. I've in a while. You have been on the flagship before, but it's been a while. <laughs> um, I'm, just, I'm just joshing. And, and we did that. We actually, we, 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 at one point, we were doing an hour show. Right. Uh, and we were covering all different aspects, including residential. Uh, that was back when we had you on. And we realized two things. First of all, um, an hour is an awful long time to listen to me. And the second thing is there are times and there are weeks where we sacrifice commercial stories for residential stories. And if you are driving into the office on a Monday morning and you're a commercial dealer, but we're talking about something going on with CDA, you don't care. It doesn't, it doesn't impact you, right? So that's why we split the show. Uh, and so Are we you strategic... finding better readership or, or followership since segmenting the content? In the, Absolutely. In the, in the world of marketing, it's a general good best practice. If you segment your audiences, you put messages and content in front of an audience that cares more, they're more likely to, to continue to follow you. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so we're getting a, a better response actually from both, from both sides, uh, which has been very encouraging. Now, I'm curious of our followers right now on Facebook, how many uh, have listened to one of your shows? So I'm going to ask... Uh, if you are uh, watching us right now and listening to us, uh, type in a comment and you can say yes or no. And if you say yes, you know, let me know uh, what you've actually um, been able to listen to. And uh, same thing, if, if you have not, say no, just so uh, that's going to be some good intel uh, for us to have. Yeah. So uh, please don't be shy. Type into the comments. Give us a yes or a no. And if you've Listen to one. Let us know um, what that is. Real, now, real quickly, you, you mentioned segmenting. I'm sorry. You mentioned segmenting. The other sure. thing that we do is, is our monthly shows. Uh, we take a monthly look at different aspects of the industry. So one of the things, uh, we have a, a program dedicated to programming, uh, which came out of my love of programming. Um, we have one dedicated to the education market, one dedicated to marketing and social media in the AV space. So it, you're, you're right in segmenting is, is important, but even more so on the weekly basis, on the monthly basis, we're giving folks who really need to know about programming or, 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 or are interested in that or really need to dig down into how do they market their company locally or, or nationally. Now, you and I were talking offline. You're also developing something new. Now, I don't know if this is public knowledge, so I'm not going to give the details, but uh, I'm going to highlight the concept as I understood it, which was – giving your listeners nuggets of information as you go through all of the weekly interviews that you conduct and the content you, you capture, your, your, the concept or the idea was that you want to try to put bite-sized pieces of content out there for your audience. Is that something you could uh, give a little bit of clarity on? 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a brand new, I'm going to call it a brand new podcast, even though the content is not brand new. Um, it, what it is, is, is something we're calling the daily download. And because we produce so many pieces of content and so much, so many podcasts, not everybody can listen to everything. And I really don't expect everybody to listen to everything um, because a marketer doesn't, it may not, may not be interested in programming and, and vice versa. But it's, it's five to six minutes on a daily basis and it's snippets of our, of our other shows. Right. So uh, today I'm actually in, in, in the studio producing uh, next week's daily download. And, and every day, Monday through Friday, we'll give out a five minute little snippet of a program that we've done in the last month. Uh, the ones I'm doing for next week, we did a show. We, we, we started a new program called ITAV. And that is looking at the IT world through the lens of AV and the audio video world through the lens of IT. And the segment I'm producing for next week is we, we did a segment and we talked about the WannaCry virus from last month. And how that impacts the world of audio video, both from a residential side and, and a commercial side. Because the one thing that came out of that virus, one of that virus, is the fact that the reason people were infected with that is because they didn't update their firmware. They didn't update their software. Same thing applies in the world of audio video. If, if, if a manufacturer does the testing and re- figures out that, hey, they need to do a security patch or they need to do a firmware update. Well, guess what? You, you kind of need to, to, follow, to follow along what, what the manufacturer is saying and say, okay, you know, I'll, I'll update my firmware, I'll update my software to make sure that, that your network and your systems are safe. Got it. Understood. By the way, uh, Tim, I think we're going to have a bunch of new listeners for you. Um, Excellent. People are saying, I, Chris uh, says he's late to the game, but he's going to start listening to you now. Excellent. So there you go. And, Thank you, Chris. Um, let's see. System design and integration. Uh, somebody signed in as their that integration firm says, no, but we definitely will listen to you. So well, thank you. There you go. You've earned at least a couple of uh, new listeners here by, by joining me today. Now, the, the version of AV Nation that you've described, um, do you see this as what you will be five years from now? Or is this a, a living, <laughs> breathing thing? Or what, what's your opinion on that? It's a living, breathing thing. Uh, you know, I could ask you the same thing about One Firefly. <laughs> is, is this the last iteration? Oh, don't of go Firefly? there. Because uh, it's know, not. You know, it's, yeah. it's, you know I mean, I, I compare, you know, I, I don't compare us to a lot of folks, but, but I would, because com- we're a media company, um, I would say, okay, take a look at Time Magazine, which we are not Time Magazine. I am no way, shape, or form saying that we are. But look at Time Magazine from 100 years ago. It is not the same entity as it is now. Um, my first job in radio was a, a company called KMOX. It was a radio station in KMOX. It, it was uh, the flagship for the Cardinal Baseball. It was a news talk station. 15, 17 years ago when I, li- when I worked there, they were still playing things off of carts, which if you're not familiar with carts, it's a, it's a version of an 8-track player. And, you know, had no interest in video, had no interest in anything. And, and as I was transitioning out of that station into another, they were just starting to start creating blogs, uh, you know, and, and writing content on their website and producing things for the website. And now if you go to KMOX's website, you're going to find video. You're going to find fully produced video, right? Where 20 years ago, KMOX would have never considered doing video in any way, shape or form because they were a radio station. Right. Same thing with Aviation. You know, six years ago when we started, we had one podcast and it was audio only and that was it. Six years later, we're doing video for 90% of our podcast. We are going to trade shows and covering them and bringing the folks who aren't able to go to Orlando next week. Interviews with, with the booths and interviews with the companies that are going there and, and showing their wares and showing their latest, greatest things and asking them why it matters and asking them how it impacts the dealers and how it impacts the programmers and the engineers and the tech, ne- technicians. And something that I would have never guessed that we would have done six years ago. Um, so what next five years is, who, who the heck knows? Uh, the heck we'll still knows. be doing podcasts, but um, we may be doing other things as well. Now, I, I know that you're a big fan. I mean, having listened to a lot of your shows and, and having known you for a while, Tim, you're a big fan of integrators taking charge of their, their business and their marketing yep. and, and actively pursuing marketing efforts and PR is is the the shows and and the the um, perhaps the guest appearances that you have? Do you think that's the right format for an integrator if they want to get um, improve their marketing or their PR, or are there other avenues you you would recommend that they pursue? What are your thoughts I, around that? Here's the thing: I I appreciate the integrators that come on our show, 
But if they're coming on our show to get marketing uh, ex- ex- uh, exposure to a Fortune 500 company or to you know an IT manager, it's it's we're not it. Uh, I'll be flat out honest. Um, you need to go where your audience is. Um, I say that because folks like us and and other uh, audio video marketing people um, appreciate the integrators and their time and their expertise. But with the exception of SEO, with, uh, of SEO increase, which you're, you're smarter than me than I uh, than I am on that. Oh, don't but go there. There, I there is. Promise you that. I just well, employ really smart people. <laughs> you employ smart people. All right. Well, I'll give you that. Um, there, there is, there's something to be said for you know your name being associated with with other websites and and your your company being associated with other websites and that coming up in an SEO search. But you need to go where your clients are. You know, you need to go where they live. So if you're going after architects, well, then then go after AIA, right? And, and get in those magazines and give those magazines content, right? If you're going after the IT manager, well, then let's start to, talking about, you know, let's start talking about getting in with CDW or getting in with, with some other publications that cater to those uh, clients. So really the, the business, whether it's the integrator or uh, the manufacturer, whoever that is, or the local flower shop, yep. whoever that, that business entity is, defining their audience and then looking at the best ways to get in front of that audience. Yep. And a Absolutely. lot of your readership or followership are, are within the industry, so they're either manufacturers or integration firms. Is that a a fair assumption about the demographics of, of your, the people that follow your content? Yep. 60% of our, of our audience is integrators. Uh, another 20 ish is, is tech managers. So there is some value if you are on, uh, and you're a local integrator and, you know, part of our audience happens to be, you know, in your neck of the woods, then there's a value there, right? We, we, we do have a, a fair amount of, of tech managers that listen to us. And the, the remainder of our audience is manufacturers and industry associations and other press and, and consultants. So I would then assume uh, you have uh, a, a great forum for manufacturers or manufacturer spokespeople to espouse their wares, their products and services and what's going on. Um, is that a fair statement? And if so, how does a, a company go about um, being on one of your different shows or, or podcasts? Yeah, I would answer the question differently if you asked me about manufacturers. Yes, manufacturers absolutely belong on our shows, right? Um, <laughs> okay. Because that's where your audience is, right? And we're not the only we're not the only podcast out there that does AV. Um, but you are but the best. I uh, that that is that is <laughs> uh, subject to everybody's uh, opinion. Uh, we appreciate those who think so. Um, but yeah, I mean, manufacturers it gives them a chance to answer certain questions. Uh, I was talking to a gentleman this morning and, and relaying a, a story that it, it's one of those it's one of like two or three stories that we get to to kind of a feather in our own cap. But the week that uh, Harmon announced the purchase of AMX, and this has been two or three years ago now, we had on the the VP of marketing for AMX, and he was able to explain the sale, explain the thinking behind it, and what it meant not only for AMX and for their employees, but also for their dealers. And that was a great opportunity for AMX to position and frame that sale and allay any fears that any integrator may have going, you know, going into the weekend and going into Infocom. Um, but it was also a, a chance for the integrator to go, okay, you know, here's here's AMX being, you know, fortright and and coming on a program and, and talking about it at length uh, and honestly. And we've had you know, other cases where. You know, uh, integrators or uh, manufacturers have come on, talk about, you know, maybe some unfortunate things that have happened, whether it's in, a, in, a, in an installation or, you know, product or what have you, um, to talk about, you know, the realness of, of their products and, and their services. And the other side, they also get to talk about the, the great things that, that, that they can do. Um, and I, I still go into every interview asking why. Um, I've said on many occasions when I've been interviewed, I am not the smartest guy in the room and I never will be. And that's on purpose. Uh, I'm the most curious, but I'm not the smartest guy. I surround myself with smart people and ask them uh, curiosity based questions. Awesome. Love it. Uh, By the way, Tim, on Facebook, we have Yuval. Ah, Yuval Kramer. Yuval says, uh, when Tim is talking, I'm listening. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, when Yuval Kramer is playing a guitar, I'm listening. So, yeah, his his picture here is of a, a fella playing a guitar. A that would be him. Director of audio at Kramer Electronics. Yes, and an incredible guitar player. Oh, that's awesome. Also, a gentleman named uh, William. Uh, uh, again, I'm going to refrain from uh, mentioning last names, but he says, uh, uh, "How are we communicating?" And what we need, how we are communicating and what we need to communicate is evolving. So everything that wants to be around us, so everything that must to be around us must change. It's a very profound statement there, William. I think mm -hmm. uh, you're hearing Tim and I agree with you and, and, and commentate on, uh, I don't even know if that's a word, commentate? Is that a word? Sure. Uh, I'm an engineering major, not an English major, so sometimes I suffer with those fancy things called words. Uh, but anyway, William, thank you for following us. Thank you for watching, and thanks for posting. Uh, greatly appreciated. If you're late uh, to joining us, please share this uh, so that your friends in the industry can uh, hear everything that Tim has to say. He's got a lot of valuable information. And uh, again, thanks for following us. So, Tim, I'm going to take this in a little bit of a different direction, and I just yep. want to talk about an exciting technology that's kind of all the rage, uh, and that, of course, would be voice control, voice oh, automation. <laughs> uh, now, I'm actually curious, before we kind of go down, i got a couple different paths I want to go, if time permits. But is this like a thing in the Infocom universe? Do, do commercial <laughs> integrators even care about voice, or is this all a, a resi conversation? Not yet, but they should. Okay. Uh, and I'll say why. Um, I, I've, I actually got the chance to teach a class on IoT and voice and security uh, over the last couple of months. And I, I did a couple of sessions in, in various parts of the country. And I wrote a blog post based on that class. Voice control is going to be the next commercial thing that pops its head into into commercial residential thing that pops its head into commercial 10 years ago you would never have guessed that we would be able to send wireless video over you know video wirelessly to a display mm -hmm. suddenly apple tv comes out and the ceo comes into a boardroom or comes into a meeting or comes into a, talks to his it manager says you know what my 15 year old teenager just threw a, a video onto my tv th from his iphone or from his ipad why can't i do that and suddenly, you know, they were putting in Apple TVs into commercial installations, not to the chagrin of, of commercial integrators. Well, companies like Barco and Christie and others and, and Kramer and, and others have, uh, Crestron and Amex, I could name a thousand of them, have come along and said, here's a commercial version of that. It's more secure. It's more robust. You can, you can do, you know, quad, all kinds of really great things. But it started with the Apple TV. Right. That whole wireless video thing started with the Apple TV. Same thing here in six months or in nine months. I'm not even going to give you a year. The CEO is going to walk into a boardroom, or talk to his IT managers, whatever, and says, you know what? I can turn my lights on with my voice now with that, with that Alexa thing at my house. Why can't I do it here? That question, that line is going to drive voice control in the commercial space. Now, just like the Apple TV, it most likely will not end up being the Alexa. It may very well. You know, Amazon may get on board and give the commercial folks some, some really great hooks, and they've already partnered with Crestron. They've already partnered with, with Control 4, some other really great control companies. But also watch what other people are doing. Harman, in a partnership with IBM, is, is, is getting into voice control, but not through Alexa. They're using IBM's Watson. Watson. Exactly. Yeah. And there's an old line about nobody ever got fired for hiring Xerox or hiring IBM. There's right. a reason for that, right? Um, so Harman is going down the road, still doing voice control, but they're doing it with, with Watson. And they're doing it with Watson's learning platform and their learning power. Uh, the other thing that, that's allowing them to do is they can customize it. The thing that they were showing at ISE, which I actually expected at Infocom next week, is the little kiosk they, they had. It was a, a clock radio. And you walked in and you said, Marriott, turn the lights on. That's something you can't do with Alexa. You can't customize Alexa's voice command, right? You've got one of three commands. You've got Alexa, you've got Echo, you've got um, Amazon. With right. Watson and with IBM, Harman is able to customize 
their voice control uh, and, you know, the fact that they're using IBM and this, that and the other is, is going to give them a, com- a little bit of an advantage in the commercial world. Now, I'm curious what your thoughts are as to how this ultimately plays out, whether it be resi or commercial. You know, and I'll just give you a personal example that just happened yeah. to me this this past weekend. You know, I recently got a new car. And uh, we're at the dealership getting something. Uh, we had a, a light pop up on the dash. We had to get some new firmware. And uh, I just, there's this voice with this sound waves coming out of it. I know that I'm supposed to be able to talk to my car and make it do things, but I don't really know what those things are. And I looked through the manual and it's pretty weak. So I asked the IT guy. So literally this a car dealership has an IT professional that sits with you in your car to teach you the, how the tech works. And, and he starts rattling off all of the sequence of words which start making the car do really neat things. And yep. it pulled up Google Earth and it, 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 it started to do this, that, and the other. And it was fascinating. But I said, so how in the world am I supposed to know those sequence of words that result in this ac- action? I said, is there like a cheat sheet? Silly enough, his answer was no. There's no nope. cheat sheet. Um, and you had to go to the help file on the dash. So that just raises to me and maybe to anyone in this space an obvious question, which is you have all of these different companies playing with voice control. Yep. And the, you know, I'm going to say the dirty word standards. There doesn't seem to be a standard in terms of how you talk to your technology to make it do something. And it can be very frustrating. Yep. So how do you see the the poor i'll say end user coping with this and what do we in the av space how do we cope with this the second part i'll ask first i'll answer first we cope with it the way we've coped with everything when it comes to control and automation um you make it as user-friendly and intuitive as possible um i am of the school of thought again I, i was a programmer still program from time to time I'm of the school of thought that if it takes more than three buttons, it's a bad design from a UI standpoint. If it takes you more than about a minute or 30 seconds to explain to someone how to do voice control, then the the keywords, the hooks are wrong, right? Um, Mm -hmm. In in my presentation, I I mentioned the fact that the one thing that that is going to actually help commercial and residential dealers in with voice control is – this missing step right now out of the box i can put an alexa on my on my kitchen counter and if i have a nest i can say alexa tell nest to make it 75 degrees that's a that's a speed bump linguistically Mm -hmm. and for our human brains instead i say alexa make it 75 degrees in here right so it's it's getting under understanding natural speech, and it's going to take some learning, right? And it's going to take some really horrible designs and some really horrible installs for us to finally get it right. But we'll get it right eventually, because just like we we've gotten right uh, the UI, and we've gotten help honestly from the tech sector, and the There's also some really bad UIs out there. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But the but the ones that 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 kind of re- give us the standard that we're used to, and I, I use the word standard too. Um, but the regular user interface of a cell phone, right? The vast majority of Americans have a smartphone of, of some sort, and so they're used to that interface, right? So if you right. emulate that and the, and the fact that it, it takes one or two clicks maybe to get to where you're going on your cell phone, same thing with the, the graphical UI. With voice control, if it's natural speech, right, if it makes sense in my head for me to say, Alexa, I'm home, well, from the back end, all sorts of these really great things can happen. Lights can come on, you know, the, the, the stove can preheat, jazz can come on the radio or whatever music you like, uh, you know, the shades can come down, all this stuff. Or, you know, good, you know Alexa, good night. You know, locks, lock, shades go down, lights go off, you know, everything Internet like that. Internet of things. Almost anything can happen these days. Yes, absolutely. But that's what we've been doing for years, right? right. IoT is nothing more than, multi, than, than all these disparate devices talking to each other. That's all a freaking control system is, is one thing that makes all these disparate devices uh, connect to each other. And that's why I'm very bullish on control and automation still having a place in both the residential and the commercial space. It's because we've been doing it for years, right? Do you you see uh, voice as continuing to grow in its importance as Mm -hmm. an input to the system? 
Absolutely. both residentially and commercially. You don't think that's going to be a fad. You think that's the new normal. I don't. Um, new normal, I would I would caution yet on the commercial side. New normal, absolutely, in the residential, especially when you get to a certain threshold of the cost of the home and the cost of the system, right? Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I will caution, though, is I honestly don't think it will ever replace completely. Sure. Um, again, because I'm of the school of thought is you've got to have you, – you need to have at least one hardwired or, or, or at least one – uh, physical device that you can push a button in case all heck breaks loose and you know you can't talk to Alexa because let's not forget if you lose the internet you lose that voice control function and I don't care if it's if it's Watson or Alexa or Google Home or whoever you lose the internet you lose that connectivity and so you need some, you still need a way to control your home. Now this week I believe while you you were producing a a, a Resi Week episode yep. the news broke regarding Apple's entry into the speaker HomePod uh, uh, HomePod there you go the HomePod device what's your opinion if if you don't mind uh, hmm? you know, a couple of words on that what that's going to mean for the space I love it uh, <laughs> I, it, it's probably going to sound pretty good don't you think it, it is and it's I I love it because I'm of the opinion the more comp- the more competition the better. Uh, because the more competitors in a space, that means they make each other better. And I don't care if that's media, I don't care if it's switchers, I don't care if it's control or voice control, uh, or voice automation. Um, it's gonna it's gonna make everybody better. And so the fact that Apple has gotten into it, um, you know, we on that show, uh, a couple of the guests said it, it kind of feels like a like a me too. It does. Absolutely. I'll give you that. If anything, they're late to the game, but absolutely. maybe they were making it better during that time. Possibly. Possibly. But let's understand. Apple has never um, – I'm trying to think of – make sure I, I qualify this, but I, am, I'm, I can't think of a, of a device that Apple has fully um, invented straight out of the gate and, and brought a brand new thing to the market. Right. Even the iPhone. I mean, there was already smart devices on the market. I had one. I, I had one of the original Palm Trios, yep, right? I did as well. That was not – you know, the smartphone was not new. Right. Um, the tablet was not new. Uh, a, a handheld computer was, was had been around for a while. Um, the, the, the Apple, the original Apple, was not new. Right. There was already personal computing that was, that was going on in the 70s and the 80s. Do, um, do you get to hear one or see one next week? Will they be at Infocom or no? I, they won't. Eh, they might be at Infocom. It's possible. Might be but they don't, they, don't, they don't release them until December I got uh, in the U.S. and the U.K. and Australia, I believe. All right, Tim, I'm going to wrap up with this here. Just one more question. Uh, I usually try to keep these to 30 minutes, but we're at 40 minutes now, and, and uh, I think I could go another uh, hour because uh, you're doing such a great job answering the questions and, and being very fun to interview. So thank you for that. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll kind of go uh, 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 off the wall a bit for this last question, and that sure. is if you could interview anybody in the world, and uh, I'll do one, I'll say it one way, uh, they could be living or dead. Oh, wow. Or, and the other version would be they have to be alive right now. Okay. Um, for one of your shows, who who would that be? Who would those people be? Um. Living or dead for one of my shows, yeah, uh, Nikolai. Sure. Ni- from one of my shows, Living or Dead, Nikolai Tesla. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was just in if, the uh, Museum of uh, what sh- Science and Industry in Chicago last week, yep. and uh, they were popping the Tesla coil overhead, and it was <laughs> pretty fantastic. Yeah. But yeah, I interrupted. You were getting ready to. No. Answer that. The, the reason for that is if you if you look back at some of Tesla's, not just his inventions, but also his predictions, I would love to see what he thinks about his predictions now and to get his two cents on what he sees for the next 60 or 70 years. Oh, yeah. That's a yeah. good one. Well, on that note, Tim, thank you very much, sir. Thanks for yes, sir. being a, a guest on Automation Unplugged. And uh, to my audience, I'm going to uh, switch over here. Everyone, thank you very much for joining us. It was uh, a blast to have you guys. Thanks for posting your comments. Uh, by the way, um, uh, Tim, uh, <laughs> uh, you've all just posted, number one, he expects you to stop by and say hi next week at Infocom. Um, he also posted, if Tesla's busy, uh, he said he's happy to join uh, your show anytime, whenever you need him. 
So uh, uh, appreciate that. And uh, John, thank you for uh, the comment. And uh, as well, William, thank you for all the comments. So uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, we will see you uh, next week here on Automation Unplugged. And uh, this is Tim and Ron signing off.